uh, thank you for joining in. This morning we are interviewing two, not only legends of basketball officiating, but two legendary human beings and definitely two of my favorite people in the world. We're joined by Joey Crawford and Steve Jabby, both legendary NBA referees. We're going to talk to us today about their experiences, uh, life, anything that they want to. So we've got some questions that we'll throw out your way and the two of you can jockey back and forth for who's going to speak first and uh, we'll get rocking and rolling. First question to you both. What role did interscholastic sports play in your life growing up? Go ahead, Steve. You're the man. No, no Dana, I, I, sports, interscholastic sports, being in school and competing and so on, really a big part of my life. I know that because I mean, I played all sports, football, basketball, baseball, the main three, I should say. And I just, whatever season it was, it was my favorite sport. I loved it because of my competitive nature. Uh, just loved competing. Uh, at the same time, I think it taught me an awful lot in my life when I look back. It's like, you know, the world's not just all about me and what's around me. It's about teams. It's about uh, competing against each other, but being with each other. It taught me a lot of things with regard to um, – when I look back and say, say discipline, um, how important that was of making sure, you know, you had to be on practice on time, how much, what you had to do with practice. I know my basketball coach at high school probably sit there and say, yeah, you skipped a lot of the hard practices. He was right. I tried to, I tried to manipulate the system there, but he got me pretty good too. But uh, no, really sports to me uh, was, was my life, is my life. And I owe a lot of it to, uh, to at a young age participating in all these sports and, if I didn't, I don't know where I'd be without. I was, uh, I was not really a, a, a great athlete. Steve, you know, both of us being from Philly, I run into the same, we run into the same kind of people. And uh, Steve was, is shortchanging his, his, uh, he was a very good football player, basketball player, baseball player. Myself, I wasn't, I wasn't that good, and I kept getting cut from all the, uh, all the teams. I would go out, but there was, it was just I wasn't as good as the other guys. And, uh, but I knew, simply because of my upbringing, being around my dad, and, and uh, officiating, that, um, I, it, it didn't really bother me. You know, I loved going to the games and watching the games and going to, you know, Phil, Steve and I are really, really lucky being around in Philly because you could go to the inter uh, the high school games. I mean, I still go to the games to this day. And I used to watch the refs back in those days, which was really weird. You know, I'm a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior in high school. I watched the refs actually when I went, because I knew that that was my bag. But, but um, it, to answer your question, it actually did play a big part in my officiating um, pursuit. And I didn't play, which was, which was, you know, I thought, I thought of that. I, when you posed that question, it, it hit me and I went, you know, I didn't play, but it really did affect me. You know, it, it, I could, because I watched the, all the sports because I had buddies that were on the team. So I would, you know, watch the game and it was, it was, it was great. But again, I watched refs and I watched umpires because that was my bag. What made you decide to become an official? And Joey, I'll let you start on this one. Obviously, my father, you know, and I watched as a, you know, as a kid, I was so fortunate uh, to be around that kind of environment. And I look back on it, you know, and I'm a, my father made the big leagues. He was um, a major league baseball umpire when I was in first grade. So, you know, I went to games. So my father took me to an Eagles game. He said, 
he knew all the officials. So he said, that's Stan Javi. Do you know what I mean? He, he pointed these people out or, or basketball. That's Earl Strong. We went to a boxing match. I mean, he knew those guys too. And he would point them out and you, you just gravitated towards officiating. And, and I was, and my father similar to me was, was similar to me. And, he really didn't talk about anything else other than officiating that, you know, if, if you get off officiating in our, in our house, when we were growing up, you couldn't talk, you know what I mean? You couldn't, you couldn't discuss anything else. other than officiating. <laughs> we were, we were a really, really intelligent group, but it was, it was, it was that, that was the upbringing data to answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure your mom had a lot of discussion. Oh, yeah, she had a lot to say. Yeah. <laughs> she, at the end of it, would go, shut up. <laughs> that poor lady, oh, my God. Yeah, exactly. Your dad and Jerry, oh, my God. Yeah, morons. <laughs> oh. Well, Dana, for me, um, it's, it's a similar kind of approach, but here's the, here's the weird thing. I didn't grow up watching officials. I, obviously, my father, being the NFL official for all those years, and my godfather, being an umpire, along with uh, Joey's father in the big league, um, I was always around them and went to games with them. But I believe me, I never wanted to be an official. I, I wanted to be a ball player. And when time came where I wasn't good enough to become a ball player, then I said, well, I've got to try something else. Now, it was, officiating wasn't the first thing I turned to. I, I, I got into sales for about a year or so. Was a major company, had a company car, expense account, everything. And then after about a year or so, Dana, I um, I thought about it. I said, is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life? I mean, I know I could do it. I could make a living at it. But uh, even though being a very immature person in my, and sometimes a lot of guys are in their early 20s, I sat back and said, what do I really love to do? And what do I have a passion for? And I have a passion for sports and still do. And so I couldn't play anymore. I never coached, although my wife is funny. My wife sits there and says, why couldn't you be a coach? Look at the contract they're signing, right, guys? <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. But um, I couldn't – I never coached. And I said, uh, you know, I started officiating a little bit of basketball in uh, intramurals in college. Uh, I said, well, let me try officiating. And I guess just through the fact of the reason why I started to officiating is that I didn't have a passion really for anything else but sports. And then my passion for that sport, instead of playing, then became officiating. I learned that passion just through learning the craft of officiating, whether it be when I started out baseball umpiring in a minor league or with, you know, with basketball. So that's, that's how it turned out to be. And then I just said, you know what? I like this. And as Joe knows and Dana, as you know, when sports and something gets into your blood like that, you just go for it. And I had kind of forgotten – uh, that both of you had fathers who officiated, so it, it's not always the way it works, but it sure is cool when it's a, a family craft. Um, you know, dinner conversations probably do get a little dull for those not involved in the family, but uh, definitely can understand why it, why it gets into your bloodstream so quickly when you have family that does it. So kind of a continuation of the last question, when did you realize that officiating was something that you really wanted to do for the rest of your life? Uh, I, I guess Dana, uh, when I, when I was, was just talking about, um, getting out of the sales, the sales industry, uh, and then putting all my eggs in the proverbial, all my eggs in one basket of officiating and just, just pursued that. I just knew that this was something I enjoyed it. It's, it's something. And I think Joe will attest to this too, because Joe, even though he said he, you know, the inner scholastic sports, he competed in sports. And when you can't compete at a level that you want to in sports, and I'm not just talking about pickup games on at the gym, but levels where, you know, and games and so on, whether it be high school or college or professional, when you can't compete at that level, and I know Joe's very competitive also, you want to find something you can be competitive at. Uh, sales, yes, one thing, but I think that when I found out how competitive sports was, and competing against myself to be the best I could possibly be, um, I just, took that next step and said, you know what, this is what I really want to do. And uh, luckily uh, it worked out well. Yeah. I, 
when I was I was doing baseball and basketball on a lower level all around Philly, and then when I realized that bit that the NBA was really what I wanted. Uh, Steve makes a great point about the competition end of it. I just wanted to work the best players. I think that's really what it was. And really being lucky living in Philly because it was, you know, since I could remember you had Will Chamberlain, you know, and that's a impact of a greatest player maybe in the history of the sport ever. And when you watch that on a daily basis and you're a, and you're an official, I just wanted to do that. I wanted to work those guys. I wanted to work those people. I, I, I Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed the high school level and, and I, I really did. I, and the people that I reffed with, but I wanted to be in the NBA. I want to, I, I, that's what I wanted to be. And uh, I just, I knew it as a, at an early age, 18, probably 17, maybe even younger, but I, I wanted to just work the best players. And that was the goal. That was, that was my, um, I just, I just wanted to work that type of ball because when you looked on a Sunday as Steve, you know, growing up at the NFL, I would watch those basketball games on a Sunday when they were on TV back in the day and, and say, man, I, that's Earl Strom. That's Richie Powers. It's Hubert Evans. That's all these guys. And you went, I want that. I want to be, I want to be that. I want to be that, that person. That's yeah. and Dave, Dave, just to interject a little, sorry, Joe, I hope I didn't interrupt. Oh, no, 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 no. You're good. No, I've, I've always told people this too, because as Joe was speaking, a thought came to my mind is that, and I tell people this, and I truly believe it. Officiating really got into my blood. Yeah, even prior to being hired in the NBA and having my career in the NBA. And I even told people that even during my course of my career in the NBA, that if I didn't make the NBA, I knew I'd be officiating for the rest of my life. Because that's how much I enjoyed it. And that's how much I love the camaraderie of it. That's how much I love even viewing it. I remember watching Joey Crawford referee one of my uh, one of my high school, not my game, but I was at my LaSalle High School where I went to high school, and there's Joey Crawford. He's in his early 20s refereeing high school game, and I knew that was Joey Crawford. I used to get down to the Palestra in Philly during the high school uh, Catholic League basketball games. I never refereed the Catholic League, but I thought all the best referees in the Catholic League. I would sit at the Palestra just to, not the game, to watch the referees, and I just knew that it got into my blood, and whether it was going to be in the NBA, high school or college, I was going to referee until I couldn't referee anymore. But that's what made Dana, that's what made Steve what he was. And that's why he was a great, great referee. It was because he, he did he, he did watch it and he did recognize it. And uh, that, that's that's awesome, Steve. I, I, I never heard that before, Steve. I've heard most of your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it gets pretty old, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> He can, he can still surprise you, apparently. Yeah, I, I, was, I, was, yeah, I was taken back by that one. <laughs> You're like, I haven't heard this one before. Where'd this come from? So this is something, this is probably my favorite question to ask because I've gone through these interviews. What is your most memorable moment of your on-court officiating career? You know, as you get older, There's multiple ones, but as you get older, you get away from the selfish aspect of it. You know, you want you want to always damn my finals game, eh, you know, game seven, you know, and all that that stuff. But you know, well, I don't want I it, I don't like bragging three. <laughs> but they, wait, whose line is this? It's not bragging if you did it. It's not bragging if you did it, but. <laughs> but, but there hasn't been many game sevens. That was the, that's why I, I, I say that. And I didn't realize it when I was, and then Steve, I, I, I know Steve and I know Steve didn't, didn't uh, realize that there was some, so few seven games in the finals, but to get back to the question, 
when I look back at it, and you know, Steve's probably my best friend in the world. I, 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 I those kinds of um, being able to ref with him <clears throat> and Duke Allen and Mark Wunderlich and Danny Crawford and all these great friends is there's so many multiple. I had a game in the semifinals. Bernie Fryer was the boss. And there was three of us from high school. We don't talk about the fourth one. The three of us from our high school was uh, Eddie Malloy, Duke Callahan, and myself. And Bernie Fryer was the boss, and he gave us a semifinals game together. And when you look back at that, being able to ref with Steve in finals games and being a part of Steve's career when he first started and, and, and hear him tell stories and talk about that. That's huge to me. It's not the, because they're memories <laughs> and I have tremendous memories, but they're fabulous on court memories. And that question is awesome. Uh, Dana, because I've never been able to verbalize that. I never have. And um, that's um, when I look back at it now, getting older, they stick in my mind. Now it's not the game seven in, in San Antonio or bought or LA. It's those types of things. What we did after the game, you know, and, and it's, but that's a, just an awesome question. I want to thank you for, for actually asking it, to be honest with you, because it, it's able, I'm able to verbalize something like that. Thank you. Dana, that's the reason why um, Joe's like the best mentor ever. Uh, just from his answer right there, you can imagine what it was like uh, under his tutelage. I like that word, right, Joe? One of my favorite words. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's um, But I, I, I do have specific games, as a matter of fact, Dana, and like Joe. And, and there are, but as Joe said, there are so many of them. And it, it, they do change, and your, um, your favorites do change. But I, how could I ever not remember my very first final game and my very last final? And I'll go into detail. My very first finals game was with my mentor and teacher, Joe Croft, walking on the court in Orlando. I'm getting chills just right now, just thinking about it again. I'm walking on the court with Orlando. And Joe, I'll never forget this. I mean, I mean you, you've done 50, Dana, how about that? 50 finals games he did. So uh, to remember this one, I, I don't think he will. But I still remember oh, one. I remember walking onto the floor, and just prior to walking on the floor, Orlando, because Shaq was, you know, at Orlando at the time, Orlando's team was coming on the floor from another direction. So it's kind of funny where as we started walking on the floor, the crowd starts going nuts. And I said, well, I, I jokingly in my mind, goes, <laughs> we're getting a great ovation here for the final. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know obviously it wasn't. Um, but no, I mean, it's such a memorable game because not only I was with my main mentor, Joey, but my family was there to experience my very first final game. And part of this, um, part of the final game also, not just the game itself, which was what's memorable because Nick Anderson, Joe Remmer, missed oh three God, yeah. the game uh, yeah. for Orlando. You felt bad for him. Time and, and yeah. You know, so Nick Orlando had that first game wrapped up. Uh, so it could have changed. But then the stuff that a mentor does that makes that game memorable is after the game of making sure he set up enough food and drink for my family and friends that we came back and celebrated the fact it was the final game and being my first final game. And Dana, I can still remember it because you know what you see, Joe taught me this is you know, obviously in my in my career that after final games, because they usually started at 9 o'clock, 9, 10, you're yeah. not getting back to the hotel till 12, 31 o'clock. Everything's closed. You can't find him, you know, to grab a beer. And also, Joe would always order 
through the catering service at the basically at the hotel, you know, cases of beer and wings or whatever it is, food back at his room. We'd have this big room. And we would just, you know, celebrate with it. Like I said, bring your family, your friends up. And that's part of the, uh, you know, experience of doing your fun, of referring in the finals, the camaraderie of, of, of experiencing with everybody that you love. And I still remember when everybody finally was all petered out, ready to go home, go to, I mean, back to, I go home, back to their hotel rooms and go to sleep. My adrenaline was still pumping. And I looked at Joe, I said, Joe, I can't sleep. And he goes, and as a mentor, what he goes, I'm with you, brother. I'll stay with you all night. And basically, we got maybe an hour or two sleep before we drove to the airport and went on. You know, so my, my first final game is so memorable. And, um, and then, and a quick one, and I'll, and I'll really move, move on. My, my last final game, knowing that it was going to be my last game in 2011 because of my knees. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to referee anymore. It was really kind of um, surreal of going through the game, and Joe will testify to this too, very rarely do you have a final game, unless it's a blowout, not a lot of them are blowout. And this was a, a deciding game, game six, in which Dallas beat Miami for the championship in Miami. Um, very rarely do you have the time to think about anything else but what your responsibilities are. Your concentration level has to be at the highest. But this game was almost like with a under a minute left or something like that, it was kind of decided. It was like an eight-point game. It was it was inevitable that Dallas was uh, going to win the game. And I remember certain thoughts coming into my mind because knowing it was my last game. And it really, and it really surprised me. It wasn't really emotional because knowing, building it up to knowing it was going to be my last game, but just I found my wife in the stands and looked at her and said to myself, I wonder – What's going to happen now in my? Well, what what is what's God have planned for me as I go along? Uh, you know, fortunately, now what I know what's going on, but I was so like <laughs> looking forward to the next part of my life. Even though I loved officiating that much, I couldn't wait to see what was going to be planned for the rest of my life. So those two games are so memorable to me. That's awesome, Steve. Really awesome. That is. Those were those were both awesome answers. That's why that's my favorite question to ask. Yeah, no, it's a, Dana, that was <laughs> terrific. Thank you again. Of course, thank you. So along the along the lines of memorable moments, what is your most memorable experience off the court as it relates to your officiating career? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, um, Dana. Again, um, the thing the thing that like we talk about as officials when we get towards the end of our career when someone retires. Very rarely. Where you sit there and remember the block charges the guy got right or got wrong. Most of the time, you remember the times with them on the road, were they were they favorable or unfavorable? And I think the thing that makes officiating really the camaraderie, the fraternity that it is, is spending the time on the road with your your fellow officials that you you know are, are together with every night in these games, which are you know very intense and so on and. There's so many memorable things that happen off the floor that I couldn't tell you during this, during this podcast or Zoom call. But, I mean, just knowing, like, when I saw Joey's name on my schedule, um, you know, we're going to certain towns. And maybe sometimes it's the springtime, like in March, you know, we have a day off. We're going to go to spring training game and hang out and have a nice dinner and so on. It's some very memorable times that way. Uh, a lot of memorable times also with the NBA and how being the – worldwide organization it is of traveling throughout the world. One of the most memorable trips and Joe's had many, many more memorable trips than I with he and Mary. I know with Mary Ellen and I have gone to China all because of refereeing basketball. That's a very memorable trip there of getting to know the country and, and the, the culture and so on. So there, there are so many doors that opened up because you have just, this is what I say, because you blew a whistle on basketball players. Yeah. These doors open up to you. It's incredible. But I, I think, what, and, and this is something that I probably missed the most, even more so than, or just as much, not more so, just as much as the competitiveness during the game refereeing, is the time on the road with my fellow officials that I enjoy being with, spending the time with them and getting to know them. And that's where Joe and I developed our friendship, which has, you know, lasted all these years. I mean, it's, oh my gosh, how many years? Almost 40 years, right, Joe? Yep. 
you know, I, I took a different approach with this. Uh, the the off court, Steve. I, I was speaking about this very subject last night. Steve started a tradition. Um, God, Steve. I don't know even what it is now, 40 years where all the guys from Philly um, and some people from on the East Coast would come. It's not all Philly guys. Now it's retired and active. Get together with your significant other. And we do it once a year. And Steve started this. And I look so forward to this thing and it's it's off the court but it's nba related and it's just a fabulous fabulous event something that i was talking about it last night that it would be i think it opened up it was like 30 dollars a night for our first time in a, in a little restaurant down in south philly now to this huge <laughs> It's almost a thousand dollars a person. It, it's it's crazy, but it is so cool because Steve had the I don't I guess the foresight to to, to but it's fabulous. Everybody comes. Uh, Eddie Rush retired, and, and we can't get a couple other. I think Christ, some of the most, a lot of the guys are dead, but but we all get together, and it's just awesome. And we uh, uh, could you imagine Dana, like about five six hours of that, and 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 I just love the stories. And, and Steve hit it right on the head. This isn't about block charge. It's not about this tough call that you had. It had nothing to do with it. It, it really does. It has nothing to do with it, but it's that camaraderie that that, um, that all of us have. And it's just, in fact, a couple of years ago, they did a huge expose on it in the Philadelphia uh, newspaper, took pictures and the whole nine yards. And it was, it was it really, really cool. Really cool. And Steve started it. And that, that, that shows what type of man he is. Because he he knew and he's not selfish and he's and he's saying we got we got to be able to celebrate our our significant others, not only our selfish stuff our selfish selves, but somebody else that get gives their their life to us, and that's really what it revolved around and and it and it's just awesome, really terrific. Yeah, no, you're right there. That's the reason why I started because I wanted to make sure that the people were leaving yeah. at home. Yeah. You know, being on the road for 25 days a month, you know, that they felt appreciated. They knew that they were appreciated. Yeah. Right. And Dana, it's really cool, too. Every once in a while, what I'll try to do, too, that, and that time of year, I usually try to schedule it was right after preseason and before the regular season began. So before we got back on the road again. And I, we continue to do it. I also try to get together in the summertime because a lot of us had a, a home or we rent a place in the uh, New Jersey Shore. And so this year it was funny trying to get the guys together. And it's tough because, you know, people have the younger guys have kids and they have basketball games and so on. Understandably. So I just throw out a couple of dates. So this is a funny story. So uh, Billy Oates was down the shore. Ed Rush was going to be there, Joey and myself. So we have four old timers, right? And the other guys, uh, Malloy couldn't make it. Lindsay couldn't make it. You know, Wonderlook couldn't make Callahan. Couldn't, these guys Aaron couldn't Smith, make it. Yeah. The only other guy who could make it was Aaron Smith, who was this younger <laughs> referee. And I called him and I said, Aaron, I'm going to give you an easy way out here. You might, because I'm just thinking of his poor Nikki, his wife, who yeah. would have nothing in common with any of us. And even though they would love to come, I said, look, you have four old timers. Um, we're going to get together pretty soon in October again. But you can, you know, just, you know, not you don't have to feel obliged to come. He's but, out of this. <laughs> so he just said, Thanks, Steve. I think I'm busy that night. And it was so <laughs> funny. But the conversation, Dana, the conversation between the four of us, and of course, the four women who have known each other for so many years, it was like the old eighth grade dance. The four women were talking over here. The four men were talking over here. But the stories that I'm telling you, I sat there all night, Dana, and listened to Eddie Rush and Billy and Joe 
Wasn't that just a great night, Joe? That was awesome. Yeah, they're was always cool. awesome. Was, always. Yeah, that's great. Good stuff. That, that sounds amazing. And you, you both know me well enough to know that I talk so much about the officiating family and how unique it is and how special it is. And that's just another example of it. And I love the fact that you um, did that as a tribute to the spouses, because one of the things I've learned in my career with officials is every time I'm at a awards banquet and I hear an official who's gotten the gold whistle, like, like you are both very familiar with, um, you know, hearing people talk about how they wouldn't have the careers that they had without their spouse or significant other. And they play such an integral role in the success of officials because somebody's got to be at home holding down the fort while you're out traveling however many nights a year. So the fact that you did that as a tribute to your spouses, and I've been fortunate to meet both of your beautiful brides, and I know how they've been the, the foundation for a lot of what you've done and the successes you've had. So I, I love the fact that you did it to, to celebrate them. I think that's incredible. And I can only imagine the conversations you all had. I'd love to be a fly on the wall for those because it's got to be absolutely crazy. <laughs> So the next question is, and you've touched on this uh, somewhat already, just within the context of your other of your other answers. How important is it to have mentors as an official, and what words of wisdom would you have for those individuals who serve in that role of mentor? Uh, you know, I was very fortunate. Steve always talks about me being the mentor, uh, and and I appreciate that I really do but I was a lucky guy when I broke in um the refs liked me that were veterans and back then it was really difficult because there wasn't a system that there is today back then your ref it was a two-person system and it, it was a called a lead referee and you had to work the way that lead referee worked so one night you were with Earl Strom, one night you were with John Vanek, one night you were with uh, Joe Gushu, one night you were with Eddie Rush, one night you were with different guys. And it was hard. And you're a young guy and they're telling you this, telling you that, do this, do that. But the guy that I that gravitated, really gravitated towards me was Joe Gushu, who was just a, this awesome teacher. And I really, everywhere the guy went, uh, I just followed him like he was a little, like I was a little puppy dog. And, it, you know, you didn't have cell phones or any of that stuff. So when I'd get done a trip, I'd call him and I'd have a bad trip, you know, because I was not a, when I was a young ref, I was crazier than when I was an old ref. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'd been, have riots in my games and I was making excuses for myself and he annihilated me he totally annihilated me and I you know I sometimes I'd act, I haven't shared this much but sometimes I would I don't think I've ever shared this I would get off the phone I'd actually start crying because something that you love so much and you think you're really good and you think you're great and um you find out that everybody doesn't think you're so great. And uh, he told me flat to my face, you know, that you're going to get fired, man. They fired people back then a lot. And uh, he says, you're going to get fired if you keep on the path that you're on. And he called me, you know, back then it was different. People talk different. They don't, then it was your, you know, they cursed you out and they screamed at you and, you know, and uh, I just started to back off, you know, not not fully, but sometimes I would have selective hearing versus who are you talking to, you know, that kind of thing. But he was, I just loved him for it. You know, when I look back on it, I loved him for it. And there's a, a guys when I retired, I talked so much about Steve and, and Joe Gushu. They, they, when I retired, one of my gifts from the staff was this huge 
painting. And they told the, the artist what they were, what they were wanted. And on that painting is Joe Gashu and Steve Javi. And, you know, it makes me, uh, and I well up even thinking of it, you know, because the guy was, it, it, Joe was just an awesome dude. Just an awesome guy. He had some life problems as all of us do, but he was, um, he was just, um, he just said, come on, Joey, I'll teach you. He's the one that gave me the name Joey. I was freaking Joe. All of a sudden, then I'm Joey, and I couldn't figure it out. But it's a Philly thing. You're a Ricky, a Billy, a Bobby, you know. <laughs> and he was he he named me Joey because his name was Joe. So it it I, as you can see, it's um, I love the guy, but uh, they're they're mentors. You have to have somebody that likes you. You really do. You really, really do. You need that. You need somebody to lean on, you know, somebody to lean on and, and you, that you can talk to, that you can actually cry with, to be honest with you. you know? A little long-winded there, Dana, but I had to get that out. That was uh, awesome. Dana, Not too yeah, long-winded at all. Yeah, how much, um, how much more I can add to that? I mean, it's, it's almost like exactly what he said about Joe Gashu. I feel about Joey Crawford. <laughs> um, it's so important, Dana. I mean, I think in life in general, no matter where you are, whatever part, is to have a mentor. That when you're going into something you really don't know about, um, you need someone there, like Joe said, to lean on, to teach you, to cry with. It, 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 the mentor is the person that, you know what, you haven't been around the corner yet. They've been around the corner and they're telling you what's going to happen when you come around yeah. the corner. You might have to experience it yourself because you're hard-headedness and so on, but guess what? He's there to guide you through it all when things happen. Um, I always say this too, Dana, obviously, and Joe's heard it a million times, and I hope he hears it a million times again. It's like, Cal, uh, if it wasn't for him and his mentorship, I wouldn't have the career I had. I mean, he was there for me at all times. I still remember one of my first games in the NBA, in a two-man system at the back, back that time, Joe and I um, were working in Detroit. Uh, Chicago, as Jordan is, Chicago was playing Detroit. We come in after the game, and obviously, um, here I am, like one of my first or second games ever in the NBA. And it was like I said, how do, how do we do, Joe? And I remember he said, well, at least we didn't have a fight. That's all that matters. At least we didn't have a fight. And then... And then I just, I remember that at the time, I didn't even know Daryl Garrison was our boss. He was at the game, unbeknownst to either Joe or me. And at the time, like Joe said, there's no cell phones, no internet. I know people can't imagine that. And like a day later, I get a thing in the mail about my evaluation. I don't know if Joe remembers this. I still remember where I was when I called Joe. And I said, Joe, and I was almost literally in tears. Um, I think my evaluation for the game out of 100, I think I got a 46. And here I am, one of my first games in the NBA, thinking now about, like, I can't believe I'm that bad. I'm going to get fired. And Joe talked me off the cliff. I mean, he's there. I still said, Steve, what's he going to do? Give you a 90? Do you have nowhere to improve? I said, well, I guess I have a hell of a lot more to improve now. I said, there's no doubt. But um, it's that's what a mentor does. A mentor has his, you know, it's like his arms are almost open to you, just saying, come, you know, I, I, I've, I've gone through it and I want to help you through it. And I think if I were to give any words of wisdom to other mentors is to be encouraging, to be there at all times. But at the same time, as Joe just said, and Joe, guess what? I mean, he was never one to pull punches with. Um, you have to be honest. You have to encourage but you also have to be honest and sometimes brutally honest. And you have to be able as that person who is the mentee to be able to take that in a constructive way because your mentor loves you and he wants you to succeed. He's not sitting here trying to put you down for any reason, but to help you and see you succeed in your career. And I remember 
one time they're coming in a game again, a two man system in, in Los Angeles and the Lakers. And we walked in the locker room and I said to Joe, I said, boy, I really stunk tonight. And he looked at me and he said, well, at least you know you did. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the fact that he was you know, like, no, no, Steve. Hey, no, I, I stunk too. No, no, no. But the whole thing was, and, and I got, Joe, then Joe and I would proceed to go out, have a beer or two and talk about it. And he told me how important, and this is, it's really, he told me how important it was that I actually understood that I had a bad game. He said, I would have been worried about you if you thought your game was okay. You know, your game wasn't okay. And let's find out why it wasn't okay. And then we went on to talk about why and so on and so forth. But a mentor is there for all those reasons. And, and again, um, so I just, you know, you know how much I love you, brother, and how much, um, you know, you mean to me, not just as a referee, but personally. And it, it, it's just, you know, him being a, I just look at the relationship we have now, just him caring about me and wanting to be my mentor. And, uh, and now look at the friendship we have with our family. It's wonderful. Thank you, Steve. That was very nice. Those were amazing answers. I was getting a little emotional during those myself. That was, yeah. uh, that was good stuff. I can't help with it. I, I'm, an, I'm an emotional person. You know that about me. I can't help it. <laughs> yeah. So what was a failure that you had in officiating that you looked back at and realized that it really did help you long term? Joe, you didn't have too many, so I don't know how you can answer. Oh my God. <laughs> oh. I mean, it's like there's a bunch of them. Oh, there is. I'm just trying to think. Joe, if you want to jump in right away, because let me uh, I can okay. say that. I, um, I, mine's very clear cut. Um, the the Tim Duncan thing uh, for those in the call that don't know, I had there was a uh, game. I threw him out. Uh, and it probably went, it not probably, it did. It wound up really, really helping me because I wanted to know why I did the things that I did with my temper. So I, I actually sought out help. Um, the NBA helped there too because they suspended me for the playoffs. And that helped really jog me that the games were going on without me. Again, that's that ego, you know, that you get when you have success in officiating, you, you actually put this, this, <laughs> it's weird when you're older and you look back on that and you say, what a moron I, I was because you're, I made my ego. It was bad. Steve. And I've told Steve this before, Steve made a statement to me a number of years ago that resonated with me. And he probably doesn't know how much it, it impacted me. He said to me, and I'm paraphrasing, you know, the opinion that you have of yourself may not be the opinion that other people have. And that jogged me. And I didn't really ask him what he meant by that, but I got the gist. And uh, it really did resonate with me. And I found out a lot about myself because Earl Strom was a, was a legendary NBA ref who had a lot of different problems in his life with ejections and stuff. And he made a statement at the end of his career to me that after I got in the trouble that I got into, he said that he, uh, if he had to do it all over again, he wouldn't do that because all it did was cause strife in his family. And that's what happen, happens when you're that guy, your ego, I'm going to, I'll do that. You don't want to do that. I'll do it. And I got, the reason why from the sports psychologist, Joel Fish, who helped me, why? Joe, you don't have to do that. 
And it helped me so much off the court because I started to, the ego, I got rid of it. I got, you know, I got rid of it. It wasn't, it, there were other people that I was affecting and it wasn't just me, you know? And I, and, and it was all ego driven, really, when you look at it, it was all ego driven. And, um, and that's, but it was an, an on court episode, the Tim Duncan, Duncan thing that really let me let go of that. Just say, Oof, thank you. I got, I got that. Yeah, it's not, I don't have to do that now, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, Dana, I mean, I look back, I look back to, I mean, I was early in my career, um, maybe because of the mentor I. <laughs> yeah, that's because you, you, yeah, you saw, um, if, if he can be nuts, I'll be nuts. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, no, I saw Joey nuts. I go, we can yeah. do that. This See that gives me the that gives me the creeps too. <laughs> but no, I mean I remember um, you know early in my career, obviously um, not having the self control and being a little too aggressive. I had what they called the umpire mentality, coming from the minor leagues of umpiring and seeing the kind of arguments um, they had. Although you know, pretty good arguments, some of them. Yeah, um, we're just I was just talking about that one with Bill Fitch and Philly that was done. That was awesome. Oh my god. He just passed away. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Um, I um, I I mean, I, I had to learn a lot of self control. I had to learn to, because uh, I, I did. I mean, I think when you're aggressive, like Joe and I myself, and competitive, and have an ego too, that that's a recipe for disaster. And I remember one of the veterans coming to me saying the same thing as Joe Gatto said to Joey. You better watch yourself. You know, you um, you know, you can get fired. You might get fired here, and so on. And I was like, well, wait a second. And I then I had actually Ed. I talked. I had a talk with Ed Rush one time, and he said, "Why do you think you're that aggressive? Why do you think you have to go out of your way to to do the things you're doing on the court of being overly aggressive with technical fouls and ejection?" And he and I said, "Well," and I actually answered. I remember what I said to him. I said. And I want to know that my partners know I have the back. I want them to know that I'm with them. And that's what Joe talked. And he Ed said to me, he goes, well, don't you think by now, this is like my third year in the league, don't you think by now they know that? And it really made me think. And I went, yeah, maybe what I've done already, they know that. And I could still be that way, but have to temper it a little bit that way. So he's right. That, Eddie cared. Eddie cared. Eddie cared. Yeah, there's no doubt. And, uh, and I think sometimes our weakness is, then can turn into our strength, you know, where you can be selective. And then I became a little more selective. That didn't mean I couldn't be aggressive at times, but maybe not just fly off the handle, like, uh, you know, like not knowing what I was doing and losing my um, thought process. Because one thing I remember my, my boss, Daryl Garrison, he was so, Joe, Joe attested this, this guy was so ahead of his time in officiating, teaching, everything, mentality. He would sit there and say, Steve, I observe you after you've ejected somebody, and for two or three minutes, you can't go free the game. Your mind's lost. Your concentration is blown, and you just can't get back into it. You have to find a way to temper yourself, your anger, your temper yourself, that you can eject and then get right back into it. Because ejecting, you shouldn't lose control of yourself. You should be the one who is in control as an official. And it took me a while to learn that, but then there came a time where I could Ejected and be like, no big deal. Let's go. Even if I yelled at a guy, get the heck out of here, or whatever it may be. Boom. Now I just turned it on. Like now I knew concentration time. Here we go. Forget everything. It just happened. So sometimes your weaknesses can turn into be your strength. That was great. Yeah. Man, solid, solid gold, you two. I love this. So, what would you say to the fan in the third row of a youth basketball game? who is driving younger officials away. Shut up. <laughs> so take a few bucks down, tell me to go back and get a beer, right? Uh, it's, it's really an aggravating uh, thing because I, like I said, I still go to some games. It's very aggravating to me. And I feel bad for those kids that are pursuing it. 
I really do. I, uh, it's, it's really, really, uh, I mean, I remember working those games and, and it wasn't as bad as it is today. It's, it was bad in certain places, but today's, today's it's out of control of what the people are doing and saying, I used to, you know, I used to throw people right out of the gym and the, the guy that, the guy that uh, started me referee and he was an old time guy. He always, he tell me, he said, as soon as you walk in the gym, find out who the person is with the money. Who's paying you go over and get the money. And as soon as you get the money and now it starts and the sidelines or whatever, forfeit the game and leave. That's what I used to do. So then you got the reputation of that he'll forfeit the game to get rid of it. But I feel so bad when I watch this stuff and, and, and what not only the, the people in the third row, but some of the coaches, especially on, on the, the, the uh, local levels where they're playing like sandlot basketball. It's crazy. I mean, it's it, c- completely insane. I, and I, I feel bad for them because I want them to stay. I want them to like refereeing. I want them to, I want them to love it, you know, as much as, as Steve and I loved it. I want them to love it. But then you see them getting beaten down. It's, it's really disturbing. Yeah, yeah, and I, it is disturbing, Joe. You're right, and Dana, you know that. You see that firsthand. Um, yeah, she does. You do. Oh my gosh, you see. And I, I wish there was. Well, maybe there are some things, but maybe we're just afraid as a society to do anything. It used to be you want your parents at the game. I, I truly believe a lot of these kids don't. Want yeah, totally so, agree. Kids are in that. Totally agree. Um, and and of course, if a coach tries to say, "Well, you can't come to the game," or something. I, I don't know exactly what to say, except what I would tell the guys is the fact that, you know, if there was no referees, there'd be no game. Your kids wouldn't be refereeing. Well, uh, Dana anyway. knows it better than anybody, Steve. Yeah. A guy okay. told me the other night that they don't even have any baseball umpires for the games, for the, the, the schedule them. Everybody's quit. They're done. They're not, they're not doing it. And I, it's really disturbing. You know, I had one of my nephews uh, on Mary Ellen's side. Uh, quite a few of her nephews were uh, good soccer players. And when they graduated high school, just for a few extra dollars, kids 18, 19 years old, he knew that I was officiating at the time. He said, Uncle Steve, what do you think? I said, hey, get into soccer. You make a few extra dollars. You like it. He refereed maybe a few games, and he called me up and said, I can't do it, Uncle Steve. He said, the parents are just yelling and screaming at me. I don't want to I don't want to do it. And here's it. Here is this one of the finest young men I ever met by one of my nephews who wanted to help the youth. He's actually, exactly. he's actually a second grade teacher now. That's how much his art where his art is. He's not and, looking to get to the NBA. He wants no, to just, you know, help the right, community. And, and, <laughs> and it's a shame. And until until it's it's almost it's funny. And maybe until something is taken away from somebody, that is when they learn when there are no games because there are no officials. Um, I don't know. Call me crazy. Joe, you used to coach and all that stuff. But if I was a coach, I would literally say, if you want me to be the coach of the team, this parent, this parent, you cannot come to the game. It's as simple as that. Now, if you don't want me as a coach, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but I just think the laws have to be laid down to these people who Agreed. are yelling at referees and yelling at other kids. Too. Yeah. I just think if you don't lay the law down and get them out, it's going to continue forever. A guy told this story the other last week. Uh, I was coaching the AAU kids and Guy's name will go. He was a linebacker for the Oakland Raiders. And we had a really good player back then. And he was playing, she was playing against his daughter. And the the linebackers, the linebacker was a nutcase. And now he starts hollering at our kid. So it's halftime. I walked right up to him. I said, look at this was like 15 years ago. I was better shape. I said, I know you're a linebacker and all, and you think you're a big deal. I said, do not holler at our kid again. I said, you should know better being a pro football player. And you're taking shots at kids, at kids. Now, 
I don't know what the hell they would have did if if he did if he hollered again. I guess I would have had to fight him. So that would that wouldn't have been be uh, that wouldn't have been good. <laughs> but it, the problem is is that it's just way out of control, way out of control. It certainly is, and I I don't know how much you all have seen, but we did a study here at the Federation just of officiating numbers, and from. 2018-19 until 2021, we've lost over 50,000 officials nationwide for high school athletics. And we know some of that is COVID-related, but one of the top issues is always sportsmanship. And it, and it is so difficult when I go to high school games to hear somebody who doesn't even really know the rules just yeah. screaming at, at officials and screaming at other kids, which is even more disgusting. So it's it's a... It's a huge problem, and it's a cultural you're dealing shift. With it. You know, you're dealing with it. It's it's hard. It is. It is. But the, you know, got to fight the good fight. That's for sure. That's it. So this this question kind of is a continuation of the last one. What would you tell a newer official who is about to quit officiating to keep them in the game? I think first thing that I would, and it's funny. I look, I look at that as a Almost like a twofold question because you have to first answer why. Why you why you're quitting? Um, maybe that's kind of obvious, but I'll answer it because officiating it should it should be something that obviously you enjoy. It should be something that um, doesn't hinder any other part of your life. So there are some officials out there who love officiating so much it actually hurts their family life uh, that they're away from their family. Maybe they, some of these guys who referee three sports, four sports. If if it's to save your family life, I say you can quit. There's no doubt. Maybe for the sake of your wife, for your children, and so on. Fine. Um, you know, if it's for the sake of like the abuse that you take, you know, everybody's personality is different, and it really is a shame. I mean, because um, Joe once told me, he said, you know, it was about refereeing. He says. Here are your responsibilities, and once you list the responsibilities, it doesn't say taking crap. You know, is is a list of responsibilities from officials. Unfortunately, we have to have thick skin. If somebody's personality doesn't fit that, they're really not going to enjoy it too much, and it's going to reflect on their officiating. Um, you know, how, how they officiate games and so on, how good they're going to be at that. So that's difficult. But if it's if they're getting discouraged, um, that's where a mentor comes in, as we talked about earlier. For getting discouraged, I would say before you do anything, before you quit, talk to your mentor, talk to your other fellow official, and see, you know what, and maybe they've been through the same thing as you, and maybe they can give you the answer of how they got through a difficult situation for whatever reason why you want to quit. Uh, and again, we touched on the topic of the parents and you know, the abuse and so on, and some people are going to be able to take it, and some people aren't. And just through that figure you just threw out, Dana, which was just an astronomical figure, a lot of people have come to the end of the rope and said, I like it, but I don't like it that much. So you can't force someone to stay into something they really don't enjoy. And I, I, it'd be hard to force them to stay in. Yeah, you have to, uh, it's a great answer, Steve. The, uh, I'm a fortunate guy and uh, I, I speak wherever I can for to kids. And I always tell them to take up officiating. And I've had a, a number of kids reach out to me. And what do I do? How do I do it? And, and I tell them, but you got to find out whether you like it first and going out and thinking you're going to be work that high school game right away. You know, yeah, you're going to move up. Uh, -uh. you got to find out whether you can go out there. And when people give you crap, you got to be able to weather, weather the storm. And you really, really have to find that out first. And you can't do it with working a high school game here. And I, you got to get down there in the grassroots and work those five or six games a day. Find out if you really like this. And then you got to ask the Steve Javis of the world and the Duke Callians and the Mark Wunderlichs, the Danny Crawfords. You got to ask them questions. How can I do this better? How can I do this better? You can't just quit. You know, I've had those calls, those phone calls. I'm quitting. Why? 
Why, wait, wait a minute. Let's talk about this. Maybe, you know, maybe we can get you through, get you through it. But the, I just think sometimes too, the referees expect too much too, Dana, where I want to, I want that, I want that high school. What are you kidding me? I could work that semifinals game. What are you kidding? And uh, maybe there's uh, the expectations are a little too extreme sometimes for for people that start. Just another way yeah, of looking at it. That's a great point. No, Joe, yeah, that's a great, great point with regard to the expectations of officiating. Uh, people maybe get into it thinking it's an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I could move up quickly, right, yeah. Joe, like you're saying? I want that yeah. big game next year right away. Um, I still remember when my dad told me, because I was, you know, in the CBA for five years, and he said, Steve, you'd always rather be hired in the NBA a year too late than a year too soon. Great advice. Really awesome. That's so true, because if you're a year too soon, you're not ready. You could be fired. A year too late, well, what's the worst thing? You got more experience? Yeah. And then when you get in, you're ready and all. So that's a, it's a great point, Joe. The, the expectation of, official, of some officials to start. Yeah, sometimes it's on the ref. So, you yeah. know, I mean, you know it, Steve. I mean, it, we talk to a lot of people. They'll, they'll say, yeah, I didn't get into the state. I, I didn't work in the state playoff game. Mm -hmm. well, get better. It's your second year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, what did you expect? Yeah. You know, what did you expect? And, yeah. you know. The old, a, the old that is a great one. point. Yeah, this is a classic one, too, Dana. I'm in Cleveland one time. We used to stay at a hotel, which was kind of connected underground to the arena, right, Joe? And we yeah. walk back, and we're having a beer. Luckily, the home team won because there's a lot of fans in the in the bar. And I'm having a beer, and a guy walks up to me and uh, oh, good game and all. You go, yeah, yeah. And he says, uh, "How do I? You know, how can I um, referee the NBA?" And my first question to him is, uh, "Where do you referee now?" He goes, "I don't." Yeah. I mean, you sit there and you go, and that's the expectation. It's like, wait, I I just want to referee the NBA so I know I can just sign up and I'll do it. And it's yeah. like, no, no, you can't it's, do it's it. Fa it. It's fascinating, isn't it, Steve? It's fascinating. It, it really is. I mean, but even at the high school level where, you know, what Dana's dealing with is people just don't realize you've got to put your time in. You've got to put your yeah. experience in. Um, my God, it's, it's not like you said, Dana, oh, two years, I'm not in a state tournament. <laughs> <laughs> really? I mean, and that, that was a constant conversation. But Dana, you're dealing right with that on a daily basis. Yes. You're dealing it from you're dealing with it from both sides. The crazy people that are sitting in the stand, <laughs> and then the uh, the referees that ex are expecting too much because they're looking at referees that get into the state finals or that stuff, and they're going, "I'm just as good as them." What are you kidding me? I'm Every that. time, <laughs> stop. Go do your work. Do your work. That was why when I was in the New Mexico office, I always used to make the point of when you set goals, make sure they're attainable because we'd have people, I want to work the state tournament next year. I'm like, you haven't put air in a whistle yet. Like that's yeah. not an attainable what, goal. What, what to, great advice. That is yes, awesome. You've got that's to, awesome. you have to understand the age and stage and you know, yeah. realize that you don't get to start out in the NBA. They don't just hand you a whistle and go, hey, welcome yeah. to the league. I'm so happy you're here. You've been officiating from the stands for 20 years. Congratulations. Yeah. I mean, that's it's really not how it works. So there's some education that takes place. Um, if you could tell your younger self to do something differently, what would that be? You want to go, Steve? <laughs> oh. That's a heck of a question, Dana. I know I looked at that. And said, wow. I do it. I, it reminds me of a, a song, my, my, my young, Younger Me, what would I would do. I'm passing right now for a second, Joe. Okay. Uh, when I, again, as you're older, that's why it's such a great question. I've often said this in forums. And this is really appropriate. There are mi a mixture of three referees that I would be today if I was a ref in the NBA. 
I look back at my younger self, I, <clears throat> it, it didn't work. Now that I'm involved with the NBA and I teach, that approach didn't work. And there's three referees. Steve, who was, and he alluded to this earlier, when he got over that immature part of his career, he became that referee that could manage a game without getting angry. Duke Callahan didn't even talk to some people. He didn't even talk when he was on the court. He's got neighbors that he's been 35 years. He doesn't even know their names. He doesn't, he doesn't talk. And Danny Crawford, they were the three of them, that combination. And Steve, I've said this before, is the greatest referee that I ever worked with. But, but that combination of those three people, that's, that's what I would, my younger self, Eh, eh. No, no, eh, eh. those three people, I would, that's my older self. And that's what I would try to emulate. If I was that younger referee and I was watching refs and I'd go, man, I'd love to be a combination of those three people. And that's how I looked at the question, Dana. I may have misinterpreted the question. Nope, that was uh, perfect. That was okay. absolutely perfect. Good okay. answer. There's no wrong answers here. You're good. <laughs> no, there, there, Joe, thank you for the comment. I appreciate it. But Jake O'Donnell's not going to like that answer. I'll tell you no, that. Jake, Jake, oh, Jake, oh, go. What's he now? He's a moron. <laughs> you know, I, I, Dana, I guess, I guess it's just um, like we talked earlier. I, I just, I related to the, you know, the mistakes you make when you're younger. And here's the weird thing. I don't think, I don't think I re. Luckily, luckily, I don't think I regret any of those mistakes I made the younger because I truly believe in life when officiating. Those mistakes make you the person you are today. And without failure, without mistakes, you don't learn the lessons. You don't learn um, to deal with uh, stuff in your life that you maybe you don't want to deal with. Because nothing. I mean, I think in our world nowadays. People come into it, officiating wise or anywhere else, and they want things to be easy. They want to attain things like we said, second year, get into the state finals, or you know what, I should be a manager of this company because I manage it better than anybody else. They haven't had situations which test them. They haven't had situations they failed at. They haven't had situations that really you sit there and you have to, it's like the come to Jesus moment, like I better do something or else I'm going to lose my job. Maybe I'll lose the income for my family. And I think that we probably all could look back at our younger self and say, I wish I didn't, I wish I didn't, but short, short of something being tragic, and I know there has been tragedy in a lot of people's lives, but mistakes that you're making, immature decisions, um, stuff the way we acted before, it's all part of the person I am now. And if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be the person, and Joe wouldn't be the person he is either. Good point. Great Excellent. point. All righty, so last question, and this is to help me. So as a final question, you have one opportunity to convince people to become officials. What do you tell them? Uh, I don't, I'll, 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 I've, been, I've been pushing it off on you. So I no, it's it. okay, Steve. I'll do it this, do it this time. Um, I first did this for myself personally. Uh, I can't believe this is the life I've had. Uh, Jack Buck, Joe Buck's father, uh, used to be an announcer also. I'm sure a lot of some of any any old time would remember. But he did a lot of NFL, the Cardinals games and baseball and so on. What a wonderful man, this class guy. When he was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer, he had like six months to live. I still remember reading an article about him. And in his article, he said, I can't wait to meet my maker. They ask him why I was so black. Well, that's the way I feel in my life. That's been awesome. Blessed. No, I'm serious. I've been blessed since I, I reflect a lot in prayer about my upbringing, my family, the, you know, the parents I had, the family I have, the friends, the people that God put in my life um, that are blessings, but also lessons at the same time. It's, it's two things. And this officiating 
I mean, it has been one of the most incredible journeys of my life. And now I'm in another journey, obviously. But the officiating journey to me was so, um, it was so rewarding. It really was. It was. I would try to tell people that if you're involved in sports or you like sports, but you can't participate, say, in a way of playing and or coaching anymore, I would totally encourage them to you know, try their hand at officiating. I mean, I still remember standing in the middle of Madison Square Garden with Bob Delaney and Daryl Garrison. And Daryl Garrison looked over at us and said, how about this feeling you're feeling? I mean, the crowd's going crazy and so on. So anybody who's been in sports, anybody who's competitive, even say a person in sales who maybe just dabbled in sports, that competitive nature in selling, the same way as in officiating. I, I think that feeling that I would get in a layup line before a game or when I was in a bullpen warming up before a game, the butterflies and all, the same stuff you get when you're officiating. The great thing about officiating is that like the playing career ends when you're like, 20, 20, 25, 30, 35. Officiating, you can take that on, God willing, if your knees hold up and back and also your 50s or 60s, whatever they be. So anybody who wants that competitive nature of competing against themselves, anybody who wants to stay in sports, I'll tell you, if you can't play in coach, getting into officiating, for me, was so rewarding, so much fun. The people that I encountered, the people that I still have are friends, the lifelong friends, the fraternity that it is, Dana, I can go on and on. It is, it is phenomenal. It really is. I mean, we wouldn't be having this discussion right now if it wasn't for officiating. And think of the friends, you know, Joe, that we've made. I mean, look, look at the friend we made in Dana, gone to New Mexico. I mean, yeah. we were a friend for life with her and Ed and her family. Yeah. I mean, this is all because of officiating. And if anybody, you know, wants to get into officiating, even if it's just for the camaraderie of it and to be part of attorney, get into it. So. Like I said, Danny, I can go on and on, but now let Joe get it. Steve, that, that was wonderful. And and, and um, the pro level is, come on. You're working in the pro level. It's, it's, it was fabulous. It's fabulous. Everything about it. I don't care if you have these complete blow-ups and riots in your games. The pro level is at the top. But the, here's the crazy thing about it. I still keep in contact with the people that I refed high school basketball with. Independent games, memories of b being in uh, the little the leagues around Philadelphia. They had bar leagues. They had st uh, railroad leagues. They had fireman leagues. I got people that stopped me all over Philly and say. You remember when you used to work that game and it used to be, and they were, guy was a fireman. Now the guy's like 80 years old and he remembers all that stuff. That stuff to me is just awesome. I've kept three box scores in my life. I have never kept a box score from an NBA game. Three box scores and they're all from high school games that I refereed before one, the first the, the year before I went into the NBA, those games meant everything to me, everything. And I have those memories and the memories of the people that I refed with, that I ref those games with are, are so high in my life. And I have all those memories, and that's what I would tell that younger ref. I get it all the time. I get the questions all the time. I said, there are so many things, and Steve already uh, uh, hit it, the relationships. Oh, my God. It's a fascinating thing. I mean, Steve still pays his dues to his high school organization. He's a sick man. I mean, I it, and 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 – and I know he talks to the high school organizations. I talk to them. That is, that is fabulous that they actually want to listen to us. It's just tremendous. I love going to those things and talking, officiating. And I think if, if I could do anything to keep, to get people to do it, it's just that 
the games are the games. You're going to, you know, you're going to remember the games, but those relationships are, are fabulous. Another great, great question, Dana. Really a great question. Thank you for that. And gentlemen, that, that's the end of the interview, which I think the three of us could probably talk for another eight days or so about officiating. Um, but on behalf of the National Federation and our membership, I just want to say thank you for everything.